Where are we now, Professor? Where are we now in terms of what we can actually do with this tech? I know you cover this a lot in, in, in your book, The Battle for Your Brain, but there are so many realms that you discuss, including including employee tracking. That's one of the most mind-blowing uh, topics in, in, your, in the book. There's also the part of hacking the brain. We also touch on war and politics. And also, I think the, the, the overarching theme is also the freedom of thought, What, what does neurotech mean for freedom of thought? And also, not you know, I, I know you just said that we won't be able to, to define what Alex is in terms of, you know, a, a code uh, on t in our lifetimes. But we are able now to predict, for example, how will Alex vote in terms of how he reacts yeah. to an image of an, an elector of a presidential candidate. So can you just expand a bit more on this, Professor? Yeah, for me to say that you cannot be reduced to bits and bytes is not to say that some aspects of you cannot be reduced to bits and bytes and that that doesn't pose a profound threat to what it means to be Alex in the modern era. Um, and, you know, I think one of the things that's been most startling for people in reading The Battle for Your Brain is the number of real world examples that I give of what's happening right now of the misuse of this technology, what's happening right now in terms of what can already be done. So while a full resolution thought Like the full experience of Alex can't be decoded. What can be decoded is, you know, are you paying attention or is your mind wandering? Are you tired and are you falling asleep at the wheel? Are you happy or sad? Are you bored in your job? Um, are you likely to vote uh, for a Republican or for a Democrat? Are you in love or are you in lust with the person who is sitting next to you? These aspects of what has been part of our internal and mental landscape can and are already being decoded. And I think you're right, which is the chapter called Your Brain at Work, chapter two of the book. I didn't even expect it, right? One of the things you learn as an author is like, what you know, what you think is the most interesting part of the book is not necessarily the part that everybody else thinks is the most interesting or the part that strikes people is not the part, you know, that you would think is going to leave people most unsettled. Your Brain at Work left people and has left people the most unsettled. And I think I now understand better why, which is we all work. And um, the universality of work and the fact that surveillance has become such a big part of the workplace is already something that people are grappling with and disquieted by. And the idea of your employer being able to literally peer into your brain and see whether you're paying attention or your mind is wandering or be able to probe your brain for whether you're happy or sad with the rays that they have you know, provided to you, or even be able to pick up brain synchronization between people in the workplace and tell who's working together, who shouldn't be and might be trying to mobilize for something like unionization or to you know, try to argue for better work conditions. These are not hypotheticals. These are all you know, kinds of examples that I give in the book of real world tracking of employees that's already happening. And when I presented some of this material at the World Economic Forum in Davos, I had the CEO of a major company come to me afterwards and say, like, we would make a great use case for you in your presentation about this, because we've already used neurotechnology on thousands of our employees across Asia. And we're tracking so much more than are they paying attention or their mind is wandering. We're tracking things like Are they bored or engaged with their work? How, what does it look like for their brain activity when they're working from home versus working in the office and then making managerial level decisions or in hiring, using complex, um, you know, testing of people's brain activity, whether it's through cognitive tests or through neurotechnology to then try to, you know, make decisions about whether to hire or fire or promote people. These are chilling and real examples of what's already happening with neurotechnology um, and just one of the many ways in which n neural surveillance could increasingly become part of our everyday lives. And if you think about the amount of work issued technology that people receive, like a computer that's provided by the workplace that allows their employer to track everything on the computer or, you know, mobile devices or headphones, and to then think that all of those could have brain sensors as part of them as these neurotech companies increasingly market enterprise-based solutions and then look at privacy laws and see that employees have virtually no privacy laws um, that, and no privacy protections, it could really quickly become the panopticon where what workplaces and modern workplaces look like is a true panopticon of what we're thinking and feeling and experiencing at work. 
Yeah, that's a great metaphor, the, the panopticon. I think it's Jeremy Bentham's, right? The, yeah. the panopticon. Yeah, yeah, I love that metaphor. And it's it's weird for me to, to like you say, just I think weird for the collective, you know, <laughs> workforce to, to think that our employers are willing to track us. It just makes me think that, for example, if if that's the extent to which we need to become so productive as humans and we're just cogs in the machine, yeah. then just it's reasonable for, for us to just allow AI to have our jobs. You know, it's just, I, I don't think it's productive for either the employers to track us yeah. and the employees to be to feel tracked. For example, you discuss on the battle for your brain how if, if I know that my headphones are tracking my, my attention span, I'm aware of that and that in itself can make me less productive. Not the right. fact that I'm, you know, distracted. So right. that's those those things, those, those challenges of thinking that everything has to boil down into the balance sheet of productiveness is just weird in terms of neurotech. And, and, it's, and it's here already. It's not that it's in five years. It's already here, Professor. Right. No, that's exactly right. And, you know, I think um, I, I give a lot of examples of why I think it's not only the wrong thing to be measuring, right? If If we're trying to track employees in the workplace to see whether they're paying attention or their mind is wandering, it turns out the mind wandering might actually be the most beneficial brain state that a person can be in to have true insights or um, you know, your brain needs breaks. And if you're trained to be hyper-focused at all times, it could undermine the very thing that an employer is trying to maximize for. But beyond that, it undermines trust. It undermines morale. It leads people to, you know, the things that make a person more productive in the workplace are not if they're laser-focused. It's are they satisfied with their work? Are they motivated? Are they, you know, do they trust and um, believe in what they're doing and do they trust their employer and have an experience that makes them want to be self-directed and to pay attention and to maximize whatever it is that they're doing.